Yes. I have to say something about this to start out. The, the, because I don't have the book yet, The Course in Miracles, but nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Nothing unreal. I'm just trying to get my mind wrapped around that for a second. Yeah. And the last part of it? Herein lies the peace of God. Yes, that's like the summary. That's like a summary of A Course in Miracles. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Okay, so then the question is, what's, what's real and what's unreal? Yeah, <laughs> very good. You may be new, but you're ready to jump right in there. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one time, it's like, uh, you know, we have these little sayings, uh, uh, but basically I would say that that what is unreal from that definition is what is temporary and passing. And what is real is what is eternal and will last forever. Right, which is spirit. Which is spirit, yeah. And then here in life, or, yeah. yeah, energy that, that can't be destroyed, that doesn't, it doesn't uh, have a beginning or an ending, it just is. And so, that is the spiritual journey, is really becoming aware of that which is everlasting. And you might say it's very much like we talk about peeling the onion, that you have to peel away a lot of, of beliefs and thoughts to get down to that core of what is everlasting. So, you know, that's a, that's a real short little phrase you can always remember is, is it passing or everlasting? You know, that's Well, it. there's a saying of a friend actually, both of us, and I've implemented that, is, is with every thought I say, is this real or is this un unreal? Um, and I, I analyze that, is it passing or is it uh, something fixed? And most thoughts are passing, and, you know, tomorrow you'll feel better, for instance. And then that basically it's a way. Yeah. So I analyze everything, is it real, is it unreal, it's very so interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it does seem to be that, that we pursue a lot of things as human beings and then it's kind of like when we're children and we go to the beach and we're, we start building the sand castles, you know, and, and these elaborate kind of castles with moats and everything, and then the, the tide comes in and boof, or the, or the mandalas, you know, that the, the Buddhists have, where they just are constantly, you know, doing the sweep, you know, just to remind that it's, it's all passing, it's all temporary. And so, this, the Course of Miracles is just a mind training system that has a text and a workbook and a teacher's manual that basically gives you a uh, text, one lesson a day, uh, to, to come to this state of mind where you recognize within yourself what is real and true, that's stable, that's constant, that is eternal, and then you are able to just let go or watch, watch the passing. We've got a few more seats in here, come on in. And uh, the very first lesson of A Course in Miracles uh, starts off number one is, nothing I see means anything. And, and that could be interpreted as nothing I perceive, you know, through the five senses means anything. And then he follows it up with his second lesson in there, um, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. So it's like a make-believe world. Even the things that we call the natural world and then divide it up to the man-made world, we could say everything that's perceived through the five senses is still part of make-believe like a story, uh, like when we see a fairy tale and it's all the symbols in the fairy tale are, are make-believe. But we enjoy the fairy tales and we enjoy the meanings that come to us, the experiences that come to us from the fairy tales. But it's not like we need to hold on to the fairy tales, we can, we can just experience the meaning. And in the end, uh, that which is just simply is, that which is stable and real and eternal, that is our identity. So that's why your spirit 
can't be threatened. There's nothing that can threaten the spirit. In this world, the body can certainly be threatened. And if you identify with the body, it can get kind of freaky at times uh, in these dramas and scenarios. But to the extent that you can become disidentified from the body, then really life is quite enjoyable. Uh, you know, when you, welcome, come on in. Uh, when you start to, to really disidentify from the world and its thoughts and, and objects, um, we've got a seat right down here in the front too. It just gets more relaxing and more relaxing. You can be more playful. Uh, just, yeah, come on in. <laughs> we've got some nice wall space over here too. Really nice down here. <laughs> So to me, on this spiritual journey, for me, it's, I've emphasized it has to be highly practical. Uh, I mean, I've did a lot of reading, and there's lots of theologies, and you know, there's so many theologies, but it's like, I wanted something that would work, that would give me an experience of the peace of mind that I'd heard about in all the different spiritual traditions. And so, I, I just started to take the parameters off about the how. How will this happen? And was just really willing to be shown. It's like saying to Spirit, you give me the how. <laughs> you know the way. <laughs> you are the how. You show me the how. Uh, instead of like uh, that one movie with uh, uh, called, with show me the money. It's like show me the way. Show me the how this spiritual journey is supposed to, to look. And, or the way that it's supposed to go. And and I found that the more willing I was to just turn that over, to not try to use my own learning from the past to try to figure it out, the more I was just willing to, to surrender and to say, show me, you lead the way, I will step back, you just lead the way. Life got easier and easier and easier. It was just, things just started to just show up, just like almost like magically, like, like it was a, like a Fairyland, where things would just appear without any kind of struggle and effort, and it was like, uh, show me the way, just take one step, the next step, the next step, the next step. So, it, I had to really let go of um, trying to make it out, make it work for myself, with all the anal analyzation, the, the synthesis, the comparison, um, trying to figure things out. I actually was happy to understand that this world was like a cloaking device meant to cover over the simplicity of the stillness and therefore I wasn't going to try to figure out the cloaking device anymore. Uh, I had one friend who came to me one day, we took a walk out in nature and, and he says, I wonder where this river comes from and I wonder what this plant is and I wonder what this is, you know, just you know, like children can be very curious. And I just was smiling the whole time. I had no clue about trying to figure out anything. Geography, or what things are, where they come from, and all this and that. And uh, finally he just said, David, you're, you're really quiet. Is there something going on? And I just, I just started singing that song. Wonder, 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 wonder who, who wrote the book of love. And he was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> so we just kind of went along and just basked in the enjoyment of everything without trying to analyze or synthesize or figure anything out. And having come through psychology, philosophy, you know, there's a lot of that mechanism of trying to figure the world out. And I was more interested in my mind, in consciousness, what was going on inside. I wanted to know uh, a, more about, give me a roadmap or give me some, some mild structure about the consciousness so I can start to understand. And that basically, I realized that uh, nobody reacts to anything directly. We always react to our interpretations of what we're perceiving. And we always have the power of interpretation. So that's why we can reach peace of mind, because we can learn to not interpret anything uh, by ourselves. You know, we can learn to 
to see it with the spirit, see it from a higher perspective, a higher state of consciousness, and that's very peaceful. But when we try to understand it with the human mind and human consciousness, it gets very complicated and no two people see the same world. So when you go to try to find some agreement on these things, you're not going to find a lot of agreement. You may seem to find points of agreement, but I started to realize that no two people see the same world. And so it's no wonder that there's so much conflict going on, because everyone has a different perception. You've heard those stories about an automobile accident and there's ten eyewitnesses and they give ten different accounts. You know, that's very typical. And I began to understand that, that this cosmos and, and what we consider the human condition is the belief in private minds with private thoughts. So it seems like we'll say we have six billion people on the planet and that each person has a mind of their own and each person has their own thoughts. And it seems as if people can keep secrets. Uh, they can decide when they want to share it or when they don't want to share it. But this whole construct is based on privacy and secrecy. And that the sooner we can realize how, how this is just, this has nothing to do with reality. That we really don't have to keep any secrets. We don't have to try to protect and defend things and, and hold on to things. We can literally let the cat out of the bag. We can let whatever our issues are just come up. Let it look however it looks and, and loosen from this idea of private minds and private thoughts. Because the very idea of personality, persona, is mask. And it's just like, this is like the, the theater of mask, where everybody's hiding behind a mask and is so afraid of, of letting the mask down. And I thought, well, I'm just going to really lay the mask down. I'm just going to go and be, practice being transparent, authentic, and then if I, I'm with people and there's issues that come or struggles or whatever, it's like, I just trusted that the, the Spirit would lead me through any conceivable situation if I could just be completely transparent with nothing to hide. It just takes so much mind energy to hide things. It takes so much mind energy to just push things down out of awareness and, and so what? If we have a, a horrific reaction or a horrific feeling, there's no need to just push it out of our awareness and try to pretend that it's not there. It's okay to allow that to come into awareness and trust that it will be healed, it will be taken from us. And so that's been my journey, is, is really starting to see that, that there are no private thoughts and, and there's no need to protect or hide anything. So where this has evolved to is now I live, when I'm back in the United States and mainland, I live in a little spiritual community where we have no rituals, no rules, and only two guidelines, and that's no people pleasing and no private thoughts. So it gets very interesting <laughs> in the community. <laughs> Everybody's ready to share everything. <laughs> people pleasing, what do you mean? People pleasing would be to try to act or act for approval or try to please someone else, do something to please someone else. Instead of just being intuitive and authentic for yourself. So that means that, that people are encouraged when they have issues coming up to spill the beans, put it on the table. And that way we stay away from kind of set rules. If you don't have any rules, you don't have to have any punishment or consequences, because we don't really believe in punishment and consequences. It's more that we are all, we're all learning, and we all seem to make mistakes when we listen to the ego, and we it helps us learn to let the ego go, because, you know, it does't serve us, it doesn't bring us peace of mind. So, it makes for a very interesting uh, living and, as you said, it's not always peaceful at the Peace House. A lot of stuff's coming up. Yeah, yeah it sounds very peaceful, but it can be anything but that at times. But that's what we're looking for, like, to reveal it, look what's beyond. So. Yeah. So, in my perception, it's peaceful. <laughs> but uh, I just feel that way with the whole world. I just see the world from a very peaceful perception, in the sense that without, without judgment, this is a, a really a beautiful world. 
you know, we could say that it is a very peaceful, harmonious world when we don't judge it. And when we start categorizing it, labeling it, judging it, uh, that's when the problem comes in. So people will ask me things like, well, practically speaking, David, what about, um, what about ethics? Uh, what about morality? You know, basic things like that. And yes, both the field of ethics and the field of morality still involve a lot of judgments. Uh, everybody's talking about morality. Well, there's no universal agreement on morality. I mean, if you go around and research different cultures, you're not going to find like a consistent thing that will emerge, a consistent uh, list of, of do's and don'ts. And, I mean, these can be guidelines, but, but as far as morality goes, it still involves judgments, and the same with ethics. But when you do your mind training, and you learn to become highly intuitive, and then you start to relax into becoming, we'll say, a hundred percent intuitive, that literally transcends morality and ethics. Uh, because you, in that state of stillness and peace, uh, there is no sense of judging or condemning. Uh, there is no we and they in stillness. It's just perfect oneness, perfect unity, unification. Uh, there's no need to change anyone. I mean, when you accept the stillness for yourself, you really accept it for the whole universe. And you don't, there's no need to proselytize. You know, you don't even have to go around and ask these questions, what do you believe? Who cares uh, what people believe? I mean, it's like, it's, we know that the ego belief system doesn't make us happy, so it's almost like uh, a burp that's got to come up and out. <laughs> it's like, let it come up, let it come out, and let it go. But there's no, with all the ego beliefs, it's just the funniest thing when you hear, people getting into debates and arguments about who, whose belief is right. You know, all of the ego's beliefs are, are temporary, and they're all unreal from our first definition. So why would you get into a debate over something that's just temporary and unreal? That's, that's also probably why many of the masters always said, uh, I believe in the truth. And when a question was asked, they say, well, you have to find it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, find the truth. Yeah. And the, that's the other thing is that I think forgiveness, the way I teach forgiveness, is, is just learning to see the false as false. When you can, can look at an ego thought and just see it for what it is and have a good laugh at it, uh, then you know you're free of it. Uh, you can see the false as false and just have a gentle laughter at it. There's no need to fix it, correct it, no need to do anything with it, nothing to defend. You know, you're not going to have to go on the offensive. There is no offensive. With it. It's very peaceful just to look calmly upon any situation that arises. Another thing I tell people is I just, I have absolutely no opinions about anything. Uh, I mean, I was traveling with this friend Raj down in, in Australia and after like two weeks he just got up in front of the group and he says, Do you know what it's like to live with somebody who has no opinions? He said, we were at a pizza parlor, and, and I, he had eaten his pizza, and he looked at me and smiled, and he said, it's a good pizza, isn't it? And I just smiled back at him, you know, I didn't <laughs> offer any opinion about the pizza. And, but it's actually very, very calm and peaceful not to have opinions. You know, it's, people say, well, what if you don't have opinions, will you be, like, gullible, will you be a doormat? No, you won't be gullible or a doormat. Stillness is not a doormat. Stillness is strength. You know, that's why Jesus said, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He says in his Course in Miracles, he says, you know, they shall literally overcome it with their strength. The strength of stillness is so powerful. There is no opposing force. <laughs> there is no, nothing to resist that strength. The ego is not only powerless in its presence, but the ego is non-existence in, in its presence. You know, it's like the ego is literally dissolved away in that love and that light. And what a great way to live uh, without opinions. Now you still can, can get guidance, you know, in terms of what to do, where to go, you know, who to meet, 
if you're to say anything, you know, you can become 100% intuitive about that. And that, to me, guidance is, is not a sense of opinions. Guidance has a sense of strength with it. It has a sense of certainty. When you're guided, you feel like you can just flow along and, and trust that everything will be perfect when you're in that guidance. In fact, uh, there's a part in The Course in Miracles where Jesus says, when you have learned to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. And it is as if you will be carried down a quiet path in summer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's gentle. All decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. It's wonderful to think about, to think that you could go through your day and just kind of navigate your day with such ease that it's just like as simple as that breath, in breath and out breath, you know. Like no decision that you have to struggle about, no concern that you have to worry about. That just like really blew my mind. I mean, I just like this rocked me. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 don't judge me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I get, I get what you're saying. That to have opinions is ego. I, I, I. You know, and you literally have like no favorite color. No, I don't. A favorite shirt. Like, no. literally, no. No, this one was given to me. I, I was in Australia and they said, Where are you going? I said, Hawaii. They said, and so this was like, this was a gift. It, is, it even fits. <laughs> but they give you gifts that actually fit. You go. So, good, good, bad, evil, reading the paper, politics, you know, none. Yeah. The ecosystem, global warming, yeah, and, and on and on and on. I mean, it just like totally like my brain just went, just flip flops. <laughs> 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 I mean, just, I don't know. I can't say it was always that way in the parable of David. I mean, I, I grew up and I, I wanted to be, you know, socially conscious and, and so I investigated all the issues and it, part of that was my belief that I had to take sides on issues to be a good, functioning, responsible, spiritual human being and I never found any peace and happiness with that. I mean, I just, I mean, I could, oh, I could make a stand on abortion and I could get all my facts lined up, I was going to convince anybody of my stand. Or uh, with uh, like vegetarianism, oh I had all my facts lined up, you know, about, you know, how many, how much grain it took to feed the cows and, and, you know, and, and all this, you know, I had all my facts. I, I really wasn't peaceful. And so I did go through a phase in my life where I was an activist a very staunch activist and at one point it dawned on me that that I was a hypocrite, mm -hmm. uh, that I was an activist with all this knowledge and all these stands and I was going to prove to whoever would debate me, I would show them I had the, the facts right and I was not peaceful. So I was, I was an angry peace activist, uh, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> how, about my, how about the term, my belief? I believe. Yeah, Isn't I believe. Ego? Yeah, I think what we could say is, what I discovered from doing The Course in Miracles, starting in 86, was that out of all the, the billions and trillions of different beliefs, that there was only one belief that ever brought me any peace, and that was forgiveness. I mean, not this false forgiveness kind of like, I'll forgive you because I'm mightier than you and I'm more metaphysical and all this. But I mean actual forgiveness is a concept or a belief. It's still a belief because in heaven, in nirvana, there's nothing to forgive. Uh, you don't think oneness is going, okay, I, the creator of, of all things, will, will bow down and forgive you. God doesn't forgive. I mean that was, the first time I read that in The Course in Miracles, <coughs> I was shocked, like you were, I was, it was like, God does not forgive, for God has never condemned, and there must be condemnation first before forgiveness is necessary. So that got my attention, and I thought, hey, oneness doesn't forgive, cool. 
I, I can totally relate to that, it totally resonates. So then I learned that it was forgiveness was for my own consciousness, for my own mind that believed in illusions. That I needed to learn to release the illusions, that's what the forgiveness was about. And that forgiveness is still a concept, but it's the only concept that led me away from all of the rest. I will say there's trillions of, of ego concepts, and the only one that I found that, that led me out of all the rest was forgiveness. The only one that truly led to peace, like no opinions about anything, was this state of an all-encompassing sense of just see the false as false, from a place of, of, of light, of playfulness, joy, and laughter. And so, it became very apparent to me that, that not having any opinion about anything was absolutely essential to maintain a consistent state of mind. And I had so much fun with it. I mean, I was in Sweden one time about a couple years ago, and, and I went into a pizza parlor, and I was ordering with a friend of mine, Anna, and this man came up, and he was, he was the owner of the pizza shop, and he was from Iraq. And I guess he perceived me as an American. I don't identify myself as an American, certainly, but he must have thought, because he started to get angrier and angrier, and then he started talking about the first Iraq war, and how the United States government bomb, bombed the children, and telling me his memories and everything. He was quite angry. He was there with the, he gave me the menu to order a pizza, and then he got angrier and angrier and angrier. And, but the more we interacted, he started to get lighter and lighter and lighter. Uh, when he saw that I didn't believe any of it, and I didn't buy into any of it, mm -hmm. and it was like he was talking about another planet uh, to me, and he got lighter and lighter and lighter, and he could see that I was just playful and happy and relaxed, and then he, he made the pizza, and he came, and then he went to, I asked him, I said, how do I say I love you if I was in Baghdad? And I want to say I love you. I love to learn how to say I love you in all the different languages. I'm Iraqi. I'd love to know how to say I love you in Iraq. And he said, first he started to write it for me, and I thought, oh, I'll never remember. It was writing in a different direction than, than I'm used to, and it looked very different. And then he said, oh, it's Ana Bahikba. And I, so there it is. I had another way to say I love you. And he got much lighter and happier after he taught me how to say I love you. And then he says, he says, do you have Skype? And I said, uh, yes, I do. And he said, what's your Skype username? So we go from <laughs> they started hating me like, a, like the vicious enemy, and all of a sudden you have Skype. And I, I gave him my Skype username, and then I said, but what do you want my Skype username for? And he says, you live in, in America. I said, yes, I live, well, I go around the world, but I have a little peace house over there. And he said, I want to live in the United States. I want an American girlfriend. <laughs> so, it went, our, our, we had an interesting holy encounter there. It was from, from hatred to, I want to live in the United States and have an American girlfriend. But that's the way my life goes, in the sense that, that there's nothing... When you have no b beliefs to defend, and when you're not identified with these beliefs, and you're not identified with any opinions, then you can be lighthearted and playful. You know, it, it becomes like a comedy, where you can just be playful, playful, playful with all the concepts, because the spirit can use those concepts. I mean, I have wonderful times with everyone. I remember even as a child, I was probably a teenager, and, and the Jehovah Witnesses would walk up the street, and then when my parents and my sister would see the Jehovah Witnesses coming, they would run to the back of the house, and lock the door. They would lock themselves in the bedroom because they think David's going to open the door and welcome these people into the house, and they didn't want to have the Jehovah's to even deal with them. So I would have them in, and so I've had many encounters with missionaries and Jehovah Witnesses, salespeople, whatever, you know. I mean, even people that call phone solicitors, that they call me at dinner, you know, sometimes I'll have a nice chat with them. Are you eating? Yeah, but no, it's no problem. <laughs> What do you, what is, and even when they try to sell you things, there's not a lot of things that I'm interested in buying, but still, it's, it's a holy encounter. You know, it's a, it's a time to, to teach that we are love. You know, because everybody underneath, no matter what they're doing on the surface, they just want to know that they're love. 
So when we start to drop the mask and just relax and have no opinions about things, it, it, it is very practical. And you do hear this, either you hear it, you feel it, you get signs and symbols. The guidance of the Spirit does reach you when you want it to reach you. You know, it can come in so many different forms. It doesn't have to be a voice. It doesn't have to be a dove descending down from the clouds and landing on your head and saying, This is my beloved child in whom I am pleased. You don't have to have <laughs> so dramatic. But, but you do get this, those little feelings and prompts and nuances that you start to recognize that is your spirit. And when you just flow with that, that's how you can live without opinions. You just follow those little nudges and those little prompts. Just you loosen this like really rusty old bolt on my head. It was just so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> the baby thing's never gonna. I never even thought about moving that, not having opinions. But just you know, it was just okay. Wow, I just it was just like yeah. I'm scared. Um, I, I think that the, what I what I'd like to um, state was helpful for me was to really have a little rigor around. Um, looking at the beliefs and opinions, um, because they kind of fall in the category of judgment. They actually really are defense against seeing, resisting seeing something. And I think belief, that they're, they're so insidiously there all, and, and keep creating the ego being separate. Oh, I'm separate from that. Or, or not this or not that. Not including everything. That it's really freeing to be a little rigorous about seeing, as a discipline, the things that actually are beliefs that we have, that are numerous, and opinions, because they aren't just as, um, they're a little more dangerous than you're making them sound, I think, although I tend to make things significant. But to me, when I could see how much judgment I had about so many things, and how unable I was to see people, events, the world clearly through an unfiltered sense of innocence towards it, openness. I just, I just continue to stay with that. And it, it became less and less of a having to be disciplined about it, and more and more freedom. So yeah, I, I just do think that the beliefs that we have are so there before we even experience the thing that aren't even ours, they're our parents or whatever, the yeah. ego collective beingness that was there before we were ever conceived or whatever. It's all there and it's just, just, just being a little vigilant for a while during practice is, just, is very important, I think. Yeah, I think that, that they... We might say that they're, the beliefs are there prior to birth even, you know, it's, there's a part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. So it's not, you know, in the end, when we, I think all of us have had sometimes different kind of grievances around the society we were born in, the culture, the parents, the siblings, the neighbors, something <laughs> that was there. and. And what helped me was, I started to use this phrase, which was, I taught the world to teach me, instead of the world did it to me. You know, like a, an angry teenager that says, I didn't ask to be born, I, don't, I didn't ask to be here, you, how dare you bring me into this world. It, what, what starts to turn around for me with the healing was, I taught the world to teach me. In other words, the belief, like you're saying, was there prior to my perception of the world, that, that ego belief and all that belief system made the world. It's, it's what we're finding out in quantum physics now, that everything that we perceive in consciousness is there by a decision, by an election. And we have like wrapped the cosmos around our mind, and it's there by belief. You know, we, we believed, we wanted it so, egoically, and it was so. And then we complained and went, oh, the devil did it to me, or this person did it to me, or, and, you know, and, and I'm a just victim. By, for example, the belief, collective belief, that there's something out there to get us <laughs> could not be more profoundly experienced than terrorism, some guy hiding in a hole somewhere. You yeah. know, we, we all projected something 
that was, was a belief system. Yes. Even alien that abductions, was, when people say, what about alien abductions? Well, they're not attacking us right now, but we collectively created something that is now concretized enough in our, in our projection to actually be cause for concern, maybe. But it's, it, it, we, we have to, the, this, this vigilance around illusion, the illusion can most immediately be experienced in our beliefs. If we, if we start there, we can stop projecting out the things that are, we're unconsciously at the effect of, which is our self yes. and our beliefs. Yes. Yeah, it's very good. Um, it, what I also discovered was that, that this world is learned and so, you know, for years I went, I was under the misperception that education would solve all the problems. I mean, you know how, we've had periods in our, in American history where it was like, if you throw enough money at it, it'll go away. But, but really there was this idea that education will solve the problems. And then, once we started to see that, that this world and this whole cosmos was based on, on learned beliefs, They've just been learned. They aren't actual. They aren't factual. And that I needed to unlearn. It was very much more like the Buddhists, you know, empty your mind of everything. You think you think and think you know. Just empty the contents of all your consciousness.